a rainy, rare rainy day. I'm like, fuck, looking at this, like, dark clouds. But I guess that's normal you, over there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's every day over here. Have you been to the Spear yet? I it's, did, yeah. I went to the yeah. Spear, and I, I didn't see a concert or anything, but they they show this movie. Um, oh, is it the Aronofsky? Yeah, movie? yeah, yeah, yeah. Letters to Earth, or uh, Letters from Earth, or something. Yeah. It was all right. Like, I mean, the Sphere itself is cool, and, like, the way they do it is cool. Like, the screen and all is, like, yeah, I mean, you're never going to see anything like that anywhere else. Like, yeah, the full, like, almost 360, uh, like, absolute wall-to-wall coverage of this screen, and it's on the ceiling, and, and, like, that's cool. And they had, like, some cool kind of, like, you know, like, IMAX and some of those, like, Disney-style theaters where, like, you're kind of moving, like, rumbling in the seat, you know? Yeah, yeah. They four, do that. 4D cinemas, I yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, so that was cool. The movie itself, a little bit of a bummer. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it was like one of those like climate change, like we're all gonna die. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 think about the elephants. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was just like, damn, dude, what a fucking bummer. Like at the end of it, I was just kind of like, everybody, like literally at the end of it, the whole theater was silent, and then people started like walking. I was with my parents; like they came to visit me and my wife. <laughs> we went, took them there because they wanted to see the Sphere too. We we're like, oh well, they do these movie showings like every day, you know, when there isn't a concert. And we saw that, and uh, the whole theater was silent, <laughs> like just exiting quietly. Nobody was talking. Nobody was like laughing <laughs> and like giddy or like, oh, that was cool. Everybody was just dead silent. <laughs> like, I was like, Damn. there's there's something of an irony as well to doing a <clears throat> doing a climate change film. And then showing it in what must use like oh, ten thousand megawatts of electricity <laughs> to, to power like the, all those screens and speakers. <laughs> heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy. 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 Bored. too so like every, most people just see pictures from the outside i mean yeah, i see it all the time here because it's part of the strip now but it's like there's like i think like millions of led lights on the outside that are just constantly yeah. running and then they have the interior theater that's like running i guess not all the time but whenever they're doing these shows and i think they do like two or three a day of like movies like that and what's what's on the outside most of the time like adverts or because i've Usually, seen that giant smiley face thing was on there yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah like a meme fucking a meme <laughs> meme building yeah, yeah. it's uh it, it's a yeah it's advertisements and then they usually have like just like yeah either some type of cool artwork going all the time if i guess there's just empty ad space if people didn't yeah. buy it they just put up like that smiley face or something or or like with christmas time they had like a christmas big christmas ornaments and stuff and like halloween and all of that no, and okay like, nice. weird shit but uh yeah, mostly advertisements and then just like weird. I mean, it's pretty. It is like when you're standing near it and you're seeing it, just like wow, yeah, that's a it's a feat of engineering. Like my god, like yeah, because they were going to do one. In, they were going to do one in London, and it got it got sort of vetoed. It's not happening now. I don't think it was going to be quite as big, but yeah. Damn, that would be cool too. I guess yeah, they're trying to do some in a couple other cities too. <laughs> London would have been cool, although I guess it would have been really out of place in London, maybe against. Uh... I mean, there's the there's what's now called the O2 Center, which used to be called the, the Millennium Dome. There was this huge thing towards the end of the '90s about building the Millennium Dome, and it was going to like signify Britain's future, and it was like kind of a World's Fair thing, but for Britain, and it was such a shambles. I went with my school when I was about. Uh, 11 <laughs> it was like it was like just the corporate innovation zone sponsored by nokia and then like, just always like just yeah and then it was open for like nine months <laughs> <laughs> damn yeah i was just thinking like this like neon bulb like next to like big ben or something in london yeah. or whatever just like this like vegas style it works on the strip for sure like having this like yeah huge... of all the cities to have it in it sort of it's it's the one that's you know it's it's gonna out garish everything isn't it? yeah absolutely absolutely 
I was thinking, I was like, man, this is going to be so garish. And then, like, yeah, after it came and they, like, turned it on, I was like, oh, actually, it, it's actually kind of cool. Like, it fits. Yeah. Yeah, man, that movie was a fucking, it was a downer, dude. Letters to Earth. <laughs> and Ar- Aronofsky, I know, I mean, I know it took, like, years to make it. Like, I think it took, like, four years or something to make that movie. And it's, like, a 45-minute movie. <laughs> like, but like, and, and, and is it just is it just nature photography with a voiceover, or it has, or has a it got little a plot bit of a or? plot? It has like the plot is okay. kind of like uh, this, um, you know, kind of perfectly diverse group of humans like land on like Mars or like a different planet, uh, okay, and they wake right. up from like hypersleep, and there's like these supposedly you know quote letters from Earth. Like yeah. telling, explaining them why they're there and what happened, and it's what like, we did wrong. Yeah, exactly, and it's kind of. I mean, so they kind of tie it around that, but it's mostly just use this kind of narration from starting that starting point, and then it kind of goes all over the world and shows, yeah, like nature and kind of some of it's CGI, uh, and then some of it it's weird because yeah, some of it's CGI and then some of it's like actual footage or like enhanced footage, you know, right. Uh, mm-hmm. But I like just the credits alone when they showed the credits, like they needed like film crews like all Ooh, over the sorry, world. So you dropped out for a second. Oh, you good? So yeah, you dropped out for a second there. There was like a lot of like emphasis on, uh, you know, like cultural stuff all over the world. So like this is what humans did and this is what humans do. Like here's all the different cultures, blah blah. blah. Yeah. And the ending's just like, oh, and it's over now. Like because <laughs> we're like had to escape <laughs> Earth because of like climate catastrophe or whatever. That's what I mean. Like I had never been to something like that where it's like this interactive like seats rumbling and stuff as you're watching these big panning 360 camera shots. Like you know you feel like you're flying in some of those scenes because of it. And everybody leaving was just dead silent. Like everybody was just dead silent. Like, <laughs> like it was like we we're just like, uh, okay. I guess we're all gonna die. Like it was such a downer. <laughs> like at least the Disney ones, like and like like uh, the the old IMAX stuff before IMAX was everywhere, were like fucking positive. You like left me like that was awesome. Like oh man, yeah, felt like we were flying or like yeah. <laughs> this one was not. Yeah. All right, man. Let's uh, let's get started with this bad boy. Had you read this one before? I'd read it before, like a few years ago, for the first time, uh, and then I reread it, obviously, for this. But it was like uh, this one I enjoyed uh, definitely. And it's one of those ones where, like, we're gonna talk about this too. Where, like, I think the this one, the book is definitely better than the movie. Where it's like, yeah. Uh, at least, like you said, the, the plot in this one kind of gets spliced up and then put in other movies, like because there's so many, yeah. there's way more Bond movies than there are books. Yeah, I, I was, I've really enjoyed. It. I thought this one had a. We're going to talk about this too. Like this one had a really good villain. I thought too. I thought Mr. Big yeah. was a great, smart, like, and not like poorly motivated or anything. Villain. Yeah. Uh, I guess they try to give him some of the kind of communist, like Russian motivation but it, he mostly seems like he's just out to make money for himself and power yeah. and stuff but, but that's what you're hearing listeners you're hearing uh another episode of heavy board and uh, uh we're back here with uh, a very special guest he is the uh, musical mastermind behind wrong circles and also the senior uh, senior fellow at the james bond autist institute uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know him as the nanny state nanny welcome back hello thank you for having me uh, and yeah, today we are going over Ian Fleming's Live and Let Die, the second book in the James Bond series, the second book ever written for James Bond. And of course, we're going to talk about the movie too, which is pretty crazy, <laughs> pretty pretty cocaine-fueled. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, this one was originally published out there, listeners, in 1954. Originally published in 1954. And we're going to the movie, which came out in 1973. But my version is uh, came out in 2012, and I didn't realize this, but actually, this version, these versions of like a couple of, I was buying these before they started censoring all of the um, Bond books and stuff. Yeah. And uh, it's actually a print on demand. I didn't even realize because it says oh, in right. the back here, yeah, made in the USA, like uh, Las Vegas, and then it has like the date, January 2022, whenever I bought it, like for the first time. And uh, 
I was like, damn. So even and it's it's a major press, you know. It's Thomas and Mercer, mm. and I think they're the ones that own the Fleming estate, or at least the rights to publish the Vaughn books. And I was kind of like, damn. Like so, even big presses like this are doing print on demand now like it's yeah that's essentially for a book like that where you just assume it must be selling copies all the time like bond books must they must sell a few hundred of those every week right yeah, yeah i would think so yeah i actually just i don't know if you saw that i saw that the, who was it they it was a Substack article but they wrote this big piece about how no one buys books and i, I was sharing some of it on the timeline where it was the numbers are dire for books and the, yeah, the only ones <laughs> yeah, that yeah. sell are like the big franchise, like Lord of the Rings, James Bond, you know, Harry Potter still gets up there and, and you know, all the other big ones, like those are the, the only ones that are still at kind of selling regularly. They said the Bible too is like the big one. Like it sells like right, a yeah, million yeah. copies a year or something. Yeah. <laughs> so somebody yeah. prints that Cause up. quite a lot of, a lot of those numbers got released because there was a um, lawsuit recently. It was there some like, antitrust lawsuit and it meant that they had to declare a lot of the, the actual numbers they're selling and which books. Yeah. yeah. It's and not that's good. The <laughs> only reason yeah, that we got the numbers and it is awful. I was just, I've been looking into self publishing some of my own stuff just because I'm like, damn, like it's not going to sell anyway. <laughs> like, it's yeah. like nobody's going to be buying the books. Even if I were on a press, that's like putting it out there. And I have a you know a few friends that have published through major presses like Harper Collins and stuff here in the U.S. and they tell me the same thing like it's dire like you're not selling many books especially if you're a first time author and you don't have like the Stephen King kind of reputation that people are just gonna buy whatever comes out or like yeah, yeah. the Bond kind of stuff it, it's dire but i'm glad that's why i had to like this podcast is so that we can bring books back a little bit <laughs> or at least try yes. to yeah <laughs> but yeah man what uh what version of this did you uh did you use uh it's, it's downstairs at the moment i used a pan re a paper reprint from i think the mid 60s and then i also recently i bought i bought a thing on audible of all of the audiobooks and so i had a little flick through to see the the censorship on the the audiobook um because when I was younger, I had a, I had a, I had it on tape, read by Joanna Lumley, um, and that was great. And so I've listened to it dozens of times as a kid. And then yeah, this one it was um, I think Ray Fiennes doing it, and they they censor the N word, but they keep all the racism, <laughs> so all, all the racism, all the stuff about the savagery of the blacks and stuff. Like, that's that's well preserved but just that one word is is changed except when it's used in its description of a, a type of fish and then it is preserved yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and, yeah. and there's and they, they they for this one i mean this one was 2012 ish that it, that this one was the version i have and i was just thinking through i was thinking like i was expecting especially because everybody made such a big deal about censoring the n-word i was like there's really only like 10 times it's even used like yeah is that true? Like, I didn't know if they'd censored it since like the fifties or sixties. No, something. there's there's, yeah. there's not that. You know, there's the name of the club, and then there's a couple of times where it's used by people in in Harlem. But um, yeah, compared to some some uh, great American novels we could mention, it's <laughs> yeah, actually yeah. used quite sparingly. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I was kind of shocked. I was like, "This is what they were making the huge deal out of." Like. Yeah. It's uh, it's kind of just like last time when like everyone talks about. We talked a little bit last time uh, when we did the first book in the in the James Bond series. Listeners, go back and listen to that with Nanny, and uh, you know they they were talking about like sexism and all this stuff. I was like, it really wasn't even that bad, like it, for 1950s standards, like yeah, where people were probably throwing like stuff like the N word around and like just being misogynist as shit. Like it was really. No, I think I think a lot of the. The Bond, almost all the Bond books, actually, they're all actually really progressive for their time. They 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 see more are cast as being sort of extremely sexist or extremely racist now. But actually, a lot of the time, the depictions of um, the female characters or the depiction of the uh, the fisherman character at the end of this and stuff like it's actually not um, they're not caricatures, and it's it's actually quite fair and even handed. I think a lot of it. Yeah, they're sort of progressive for their time. Yeah, especially like. Yeah, and I mean, I guess you could, what's the argument people would make is that it exoticizes some of the island culture at that time, but like, you know, 
like Fleming was probably actually at those places often. Yeah, like, no, he yeah. he wrote this one while he was in Jamaica. Yeah, and yeah. it's like that was the culture. I mean, the culture has probably changed so much in Jamaica even since the fifties. But I mean, like it was like a fishing culture that had been yeah colonized by all these different countries like over the last three hundred years. <laughs> like everybody moving in and out. So it like yeah it shifted things, fishing villages, the kind of and I think as well like it. it Yes, it does. It sort of exoticizes island culture, but actually, from a from a British viewpoint, it exoticizes America as well. Like when he's talking about being served hamburgers and melted butterscotch, like that's not stuff that people would be having in Britain. That's like that's that's sort of exoticizing America. And like the, I noticed in this that the T-shirt is such a modern American invention that Fleming feels the need to des- to describe what a T-shirt is when Bond put one, puts one on because like even that would be exotic to a British audience in the the fifties. Yeah, that's. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, this is why we have to have Nanny on for these episodes, listeners. To, and I was thinking, hey, there's some shots at America, as always, which are always good humored kind of shots. Like, uh, uh, maybe it's just like the the proper like British gentleman style of like what Fleming <laughs> was and what Bond is, right? Like you're, uh, there's like a certain way to do things and speak and blah blah, blah and, and and then when you come into like the American cities, he's kind of like, oh, uh, <laughs> like what's going on here? I love the the bit where um, I think Lighter is telling him how to pretend to be an American when he's undercover, <laughs> and he says, and Bond says about you can get through most American conversations by saying yeah, nope, and sure, so long as you avoid words that are more than two syllables. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, so, yeah. it's so cutting. <laughs> exactly yeah especially i mean yeah it's i wasn't alive in the 50s obviously listeners but i mean it's always looking back it's always easier like that's what always pisses me off about the censorship stuff is because like this you know even though these are like kind of pop novels these are kind of like you know huge pop culture figures through all over the world now but like particularly in kind of the uk and america at the time in the 50s with these first couple books it was like looking back on it it's always easier to like disparage or say oh that was awful like when you're looking back like a hundred years later or almost a hundred years later now Mm -hmm. with these like whereas at the time like we we need like the context is and the reason we're doing this whole bond series is i i feel like we need to give the actual everyone talks about context but i'm like no the proper context is this is from 1954 like their legal segregation was in place like for the most part in a lot of different places i guess mostly at the south still at that time but it was like this is what it was like and and i just can't stand when everybody's going back and like, oh we have to change these these few n-words that are in this book or whatever like because Fleming doesn't get to write that or whatever. I'm like, well, at the time, everybody got to write that. It's only in like the last 10 years yeah. where where we're saying only a few people can use these words to write books or whatever. We have to police it and censor it and hire these, you know, 20 something sensitivity readers to butcher up kind of Western literature in this way. And, you know, I was, I was, I went on a podcast, uh, it was kind of a more literature podcast that had me on. This was last year. And uh, it came up with the kind of, and you know, I was, of course, uh, bad mouthing the censorship of, of Fleming and, and Agatha Christie books and, and, and you know, Roald Dahl stuff, all the stuff that was happening in those last yeah. couple of years. And uh, there is always this tendency to say, oh, well, those are just pop books, you know, or oh, those are just children's books in Dahl's case. or, And I'm always just like, yeah, but like, these are some of the most popular and most famous books to ever be written. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like, they're still making movies about these books. They're still making uh, movies about these characters. Like Agatha Christie movies are still being made a hundred years later. Like James Bond movies, we're still making them. Raw doll stuff where we make, they're remaking Matilda. They're remaking, you know, all of these movies that have been made and- from that. And also, every everything is just pop until it's not. Like Shakespeare was just pop when it was coming out, right. and Charles Dickens was, you know, just pop pop literature when it's coming out. And then, you know, centuries later, it's considered classics. And yeah, I think, yeah, dismissing stuff as pop is, yeah, nah, can't be doing that. <laughs> yeah, or like if it's not as important, and that's why I always take the stand. That's why I defend Stephen King now too. I think, you know, after after his death 
we're going to people will finally start to recognize the impact that these kind of pop books have on the larger culture and then therefore the literary landscape like you know there was that we couldn't have had any type of kind of literary spy thrillers without Ian Fleming coming and writing these 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 very kind of elegant uh uh spy books in the 50s here where everybody would write them off but oh well those aren't serious literature but it's like well no like this has become a huge part of the culture and to dismiss that as if it's not important or that it didn't do something even bigger than literary yeah. books do like that's obviously like stephen king stuff is like this guy impacted he was a, he's been a sledgehammer to the culture ever since Carrie got made into a movie because nobody gave a shit about the book when it came out and then it got made into the movie in the 70s and then his career became, you know, the kind of iconic figure of horror and all of that. <laughs> and just, like, how impactful that is. Like, it changes yeah. everything. Yes. And, like, with, with Bond, if you think about, like, the character of Bond, the impact, like, the impact on so many men's opinion of, like, masculinity and, and their, like... um what a hero is and what what's you know uh i think a lot of men that are into cars of a certain age probably got that interest in cars you know from the aston martin and goldfinger and stuff like there's huge Im rippling impacts way outside of literature and film like that that are had by bond existing yeah and actually that's one thing i want to get to with the movie with with more because in the interestingly enough i didn't realize but this is live and let die was moore's first uh, role as Bond in 73 yeah. there. I guess this is right after Connery stopped doing it or... So, yeah, Connery stopped, but then they had one with um, George Lazenby, and then Connery came back for one, and then he didn't want to do it anymore, and so then they, they, they got Roger Moore. Damn. Isn't that great back at a time when like actors were just like, oh, I don't want to do it anymore, and then you look at these like Harrison Ford's like eighty some years old playing like <laughs> like Han Solo and Indiana Jones still yeah. yeah and he's just like and he's not even lying about it in interviews now he's just like ah oh, they paid me a lot of money like, <laughs> it's yeah. Just like yeah I couldn't turn down that huge check I mean it would have been stupid to turn it down so sure geriatric Indiana Jones like so should we cover uh, roughly what the plot of Live and Let Die is for yeah yeah, yeah yeah let's go into that. Is it's it's very different from the from Casino Royale. In viewing it as the second book in the Bond series, it's it much more establishes the the sort of globe trotting element of Bond, like in lots more locations and they travel a lot further and lots more characters than Casino Royale. And more involvement with like the CIA, the FBI, yeah. and then like the British intelligence and stuff. Like there's just much more collaboration because yeah, when you think about it, post post World War Two, we're in the Cold War, so. It's always interesting that the Russians or the villains, you know, like still basically like the Russian kind of organization is still the main kind of mm -hmm. source of the villain. It's interesting. I've been watching the Jack Ryan movies recently. The, oh, okay. the Tom Clancy kind of spy military books, you know, his kind of yeah. killer character. And that went through a bunch of different, you know, characters and shit with that. But like it was, I mean, actors with Jack Ryan for that time, but it was always interesting to me that like the early uh, Jack Ryan ones, like it's all the Russians are still the villain. And even like the ones with Harrison Ford, when there's like the terrorist attacks, it's like the IRA, like the Irish <laughs> resistance <laughs> or Russian terrorist. We hadn't quite moved to the uh, kind of Islamic terrorist <laughs> yeah. part of the world. Whereas like, that's what people assume with terrorism now. But even then, like, there was the Russians or, like, yeah, the IRA or, or somebody were the <laughs> villains back, like, the last, up until, I guess, the 90s or whatever, the first Gulf War. <laughs> yeah, and there's, a, there's a bit of a rise in um, Eastern European villains. They're after, like, the breakup of Yugoslavia. You get a lot of that in the 2000s. Yeah, and it's always, like, some, like, vague, generic, like, kind of, like uh, uh accented like yeah <laughs> yeah eastern european accent you don't know quite where they're from but they're just eastern european and are not to be trusted yeah. but yeah the main plot is like bond coming in uh coming to america for the first time and there's some great jabs at the customs process uh coming in from <laughs> when you're coming yeah. into america and i imagine it was even less so than it is now in the 50s but like uh 
and he's being brought in because there's like this huge gold smuggling operation and they're trying to figure out like where it's coming from and, and, and trying to stop it. And of course it's got involvement with the Russian uh, kind of intelligence services that are trying to undermine the Western powers of, you know, mostly through, yeah, the UK, the United States and, and all of that and the other kind of Western countries. And, uh, and we got to bring in James Bond. Yeah, sorry, go on. And it hops from location to location. So it goes from Harlem to St. Petersburg, Florida, and then finally in, in Jamaica at the end. So it's the first sort of, um, first when where Bond's really on a mission, like traveling. It's, it's become such a big part of the, the franchise. Yeah, and thinking about that now, it, it's probably set the tone for the international spy, like, novel like story where you're moving from you know we talked about this last time with kind of the jason Bourne books and stuff where you're bouncing from city to city to city all over the world istanbul then you're going to paris and you're going to london yeah, and yeah new york and like all of these kind of international city hopping you know within a matter of days because <laughs> you have to follow this kind of uh you know whatever the the villain is doing and I suppose the big the big hook about Live and Let Die, for those that don't know, is that Bond's not only confronting America for the first time, but it's a it's a black villain. The most <laughs> devious kind of villain that you could have is it's it's a black villain. And he, he's having to deal with um with that and, and to and uh, the under underbelly of Harlem. And yeah, it's sort of Bond's first experience of, of black America. Yeah, I wonder that. That's interesting too. I didn't think about, but yeah, that's that's probably what they'll hit this book with too. Or the, the woke kind of arguments against it would be, oh, you know, it, it makes the kind of gang life in Harlem or whatever look terrible, or be the villain aspect of it. And it's like, well, I mean, it was kind of a big deal. Like, I mean, everybody knows like the kind of Frank <laughs> I, Lucas. Like, I think it it does the opposite for the certainly for the Harlem section. Like, the club sounds fucking awesome that he goes to with <laughs> the the strip show, and he talks about how cool the lights are, and like it's really, really evocative. I don't know how how accurate that would be to what a club in Harlem would actually be like in 1954, but you want to go there when he mentions it. You're like, yeah, that's <laughs> that's great. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and i'd say like too he has the okay so he makes the villain it's a black villain for the first time but it's also like I, we were saying before we started that like this he's one of the best bond villains there like he's one of the smartest most kind of cunning like kind of uh villains that he has to deal with and he actually gets a lot of good shots in at bond like it's not just like little wimpy ones either like bond is like hurt several times during this yeah like because this guy is outsmarting him and he's catching on to Bond's plans. You know, Bond isn't, well, he does prevail at the end because, you know, it's James Bond, but like, it's, you know, there's a lot of hiccups in that, in that matter. And of course his weakness for women comes into play and all of that. And, but yeah, I mean, I thought it was a great villain and just like his long monologues when Bond's in trouble. Yes. And they yeah, just really, kind really of, good. Yeah, like he's and all explaining. all the cast of supporting get like Teehee the and Whisper yeah. and the the supporting sort of uh, goons that he has around him are, are, are great. Um, Bond is quite shocked by the idea of a um, a black guy being a gang boss. He says, he says "I've got I saved the quote here." He says, "I don't think I've heard of a great Negro criminal before. Chinamen, obviously, and some <laughs> Japs, but Negroes are actually pretty law-abiding chaps." <laughs> So that's his, he just, he can't believe it. He can't believe that there's a black gang box. Um, yeah, absolutely. And and just how how intricate and sophisticated this the, the spy network of Big is too. Like kind of, he's got spies all over the country, all over the world really, with these multiple countries and they're all listening to him and they're all... And he's got his own switchboard operator, hasn't he? The, the Whisper character who's just like, yeah. his job is just to man the switchboard of all the spies and... <laughs> Connect it. Yeah. No, it's the first. It's the first one where Bond's really going up against a a network, like rather than just an individual guy, like in Casino Royale. It's he's up against a, a sort of conspiracy that's coming after him. Yeah. That's interesting too. So, like, yeah, would we, if you guys go back and listen to that first episode, listeners, we talk about how kind of simple the plot, and really the plot here is relatively simple too. But like, as of this being the second book, and there's 14 Bond books all together, and like at least the ones written by Fleming. I know they've had other authors do like novelizations of movies or like other stuff, but like it's, 
like of course he's expanding right of course it's expanding and like the universe is expanding the kind of the the tools are expanding the criminals are getting more sophisticated like the plots are slowly becoming more complex and there's more moving parts and people are getting more seriously injured too like with with felix yeah it's really brutal as well (laughs) there's the torture scene in the first book but there's something even nastier about a lot of this stuff like yeah the when he talks about Felix Leiter's just got a bloody shroud over his face and he's been sort of attacked by barracudas and, and yeah the um has to have like an arm and a leg amputated like yeah and the and the scene where Bond's getting his fingers broken by the um by the, the henchman as well yeah it's really brutal if you're hearing this it's because you are listening to the free public feed of heavy board to get complete uncensored uninterrupted full access to this podcast become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board that's right heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you for less than one cup of coffee per month you will receive private access to uncensored full-length episodes jerk shop heavy bonus content, subscribers only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. Yeah, and like kind of how that never goes away, like the whole story Bond still has that kind of broken fingers that he's dealing with so he can't even really punch without being yeah. in pain. And like it keeps coming back, and like it keeps re-aggravating these injuries that he has. Like, yeah, yeah. it's it's tough. I mean, I always say we we always talk about like the darkness in, in these books too, the kind of like how Fleming doesn't shy away. Obviously, being former intelligence kind of spy himself, of kind of how lonely and dark the life is, and like obviously Casino Royale, like we talked about, has a really dark kind of how much kind of bond broods in that is kind of like, Oh man, I'm so lonely. Is it the opening paragraph is just like, what a way to start a spy novel. And you don't even see it. Like most of these kind of modern spy or or kind of thriller novels start with like the action right away. It hits you with the action. Like, Oh, Mm -hmm. something's happening. You're in the middle of a fight or you're in the middle of some spy mission. But this one's talking like there are moments of great luxury in the life of a secret agent. There are assignments on which he is required to act the part of a very rich man occasions when he takes refuge in good living and a face and to efface the memory of danger and the shadow of death in times when as was now the case he is a guest in the territory of an allied secret service and it was just like that just starts the whole plot like that's the very first paragraph listeners on page one and it just talks about like all the different ups and downs of it like mentioning okay you get to pretend to be rich a lot of times there's times you get to take refuge and then it just kind of like, okay, the memory of danger and the shadow of death, like you are always at the risk of dying. Like, yeah, that's the downside. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And in this book, he really is given like a lot of that kind of the desperation and the kind of depression that comes with being living that lonely life. Yeah. But the, um, the other thing I was thinking about when I was reading it, that it, uh, that it introduces, which becomes, a particularly big part of the films and I think is part of the reason for Bond's lasting success is unlike Casino Royale it takes place in a slightly different reality to our one like it's it gets, you know it's got a character in it that's got psychic powers it's got another character who's supposed to be like a reincarnated voodoo god or at least people believe that he is it sort of it starts adding those elements of um of genre fiction into it of like touches of horror and touches of the supernatural and then he would later go on to sort of incorporate a bit of science fiction with the later ones yeah i think that's you know that ability to evolve bond to be different genres as well as spy is 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 introduced here yeah we didn't even touch on it but like the voodoo aspect in this one like the kind of the movie plays it up a little bit more than the book does but like the kind of legends the mystery the kind of and i mean i'm kind of obsessed with voodoo i think voodoo is a great little kind of mytho- mythological Mm. Uh, you know, part of global history, I guess, mostly the Caribbean islands where it was big, but like it's since, you know, because of slavery and all of that, it moved to the America, it moved all over the world, you know, like where they were moving the kind of slaves from Haiti and all of that. Like I've done a lot of research on that just because I'm fascinated by, and I'm fascinated by mm-hmm. the characters uh, that like pop up, like, like 
especially kind of southern Louisiana because I lived there for a while. I was, you know, right. that's a big thing, and that they make that a big thing in the movie. They kind of changed the from Florida to Louisiana with uh, yeah the movie, but like it, it is like like some of these characters, like Doctor John, is one of the most fa more famous ones, and he was kind of I think like the early twentieth century kind of this new orleans voodoo doctor you know voodoo guy that would like give these big you know tirades in the streets of new orleans and stuff and like perform magic tricks and 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 shit like that and curse people and he get, became very famous for it kind of mm. really kind of strange character uh and like marie lavu or uh is like another big one Yes, yeah, I've heard of that one. Yeah, and, and she did the same thing. It was very theatrical, you know, and I guess that's what the movie tries to capture with some of those, like, it's scary. It is kind of scary, too, even if you don't, like, yeah. believe in it. Like, if you've just seen shrunken heads and stuff, you're like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> And because so much of the voodoo, at least how it's depicted on, on in media, like, the voodoo ritual is about the sort of frenzy, and that that's inherently a scary idea, like, losing control of other people losing control of themselves so, yeah um but yeah the video element in this is is great that the villain is is as well as being the head of like seemingly every black criminal in new york he's also the head of, of this sort of voodoo cult that he's brought over with him from the island and uses the the fear of that voodoo to um to keep everybody in line yeah that's what's really great about this too is like how loyal all of the uh the kind of henchmen are to mr big in in the novel and and in the movie too we're just kind of like how there is nobody that's like oh willing to give up information or anything i guess towards the very end with uh what's this guy the the guy that gets kind of eaten by the shark at the end there with uh with Bond. uh quarrel uh no, no uh the villain um what was his name he was the guy with the gun in florida who's like uh is it the shutter or something or the the oh i've gone blank now sorry no, no, it'll come <laughs> up here but i'm just like yeah he gives up a little piece of information but that's literally when he's about to die and is trying to save himself by getting pulled out of the tank but like other than yes. that like nobody's giving up information they're all completely tight-knit and they're kind of afraid that if they do go against big he will like they'll be cursed or something that they think he's kind of like a zombie or something like, yeah uh which is also big in, in voodoo which is awesome the kind of like um uh immortality that you could achieve what was that movie kind of in the early 2000s the skeleton key do you ever see that with uh no i've never seen that no. uh it's underrated in i haven't seen it in years but it's you like about because there's this thing in voodoo where like they believe that you can switch bodies that you can have your soul switch into somebody else's body and like live forever you just have to keep finding new bodies you know nice. and it kind of um uses that as like the device is kind of like a scary not so much horror as it is kind of like tense kind of scare thriller we were like oh my god uh and they're just kind of churning through these people. It's almost like Get Out, but the opposite, where it's like these kind of black voodoo, like kings and queen, using white bodies to live forever. Uh, you know? okay. Like cool. in the kind of the deep south. Uh, it's almost like the opposite of, of Get Out. Uh, okay, I'll check yeah. that out. It's, it's fascinating. It kind of goes under the radar, maybe because of the kind of everybody swapping races or whatever. And that's kind <laughs> of, you know, you can't do that now. Like that's kind of <laughs> looked against, looked, at, looked, looked down on. But yeah, I love the voodoo kind of angle to it. And I thought that yeah. was creative for Fleming to use. Yeah, and the love interest also has a sort of um not necessarily voodoo, but she she has like um she can tell the future and she can read uh read people's um fortunes. Fortune telling, that's another good one. Like there's just so much you can do with that. It's so exciting. It's so like mysterious like and then when it comes true even if it doesn't come true we always think about the ones that do come true you know yeah and it's implied that she she knows that she's going to sleep with bond when she first meets him before he even knows it because she's sort of seen their future in the cards it's almost like, miss cleo <laughs> miss cleo did you have those commercials in the uk for the miss no. cleo hotline that no, was big in the 90s yeah <laughs> 
And apparently they, there was a couple documentary made about it recently where it was about like, yeah, it was just this woman who was like an actress that they like played this Miss Cleo character, you know, call this 1-800 number and you have your fortune read for you by somebody who's oh. speaking like a Jamaican accent or whatever. Oh, like, right. No, so we had, we had Mystic Mag, but they have none of the, um, the ethnic flair that you was going to do. Yeah. It's, that's always been like an enticing thing though. Yeah. Like a novelty. And I wonder how much money that hotline made because it would always oh, so much. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the old days, pre cell phones too, where they would just charge you like $20 a minute or whatever yeah. to like be on these sex phones or the, or these, uh, these fortune teller lines. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the, one, one little shot at America where, where they're, they're eating this in the first chapter where he's kind of eating like this, describing the meal as always. And, uh, just a little one sentence paragraph by itself. He says, they sat down and ate steadily through each delicious course of American cooking at its rare best. <laughs> <laughs> and he's um, not, he doesn't like the idea of melted butterscotch. So that's far too rich for his, his palate. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's always, I mean, yeah, it's always funny coming from the country that invented haggis. I mean, you know, or, or I guess that's <laughs> Scottish, right? Or Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's quite a few digs at American food you know, about, um, this is about, you know, American coffee when it's bad is the absolute worst. And, uh, <laughs> this is going to be, he orders orange juice and he's like, it'd be hard for them to mess that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I guess at the time, like the, the coffee trade was obviously huge, but like the kind of, I wonder if, if it really was not like if it like was it coming I guess it was all coming from South America at the time, all over the world still or, or had yeah, it reached I that you, point. I don't think you had baristas, did you? It was probably no. very, like, <laughs> you know, compared to Bond who's probably been enjoying like, you know, in, in the south of France and in Italy and Europe European missions. <laughs> Right, and I guess that, yeah, because it would have been like the African kind of coffee would have been the big thing in France at the time, mm. right? Like, and then, I mean, I, I don't know, listen, anybody who knows, put in the comments or something, let us know. We're just kind of spitballing about it. I'm just thinking, like, yeah, historically, because thinking back to that time, like, it, it's so, it's honestly difficult for me, somebody like me, who was, you know, born in the fucking 80s in America, mm. like, I, it's, it's, to think back, even in the 80s, like, you know, 30, 40 years removed from the 1950s, it was so different. <laughs> like, everything was so yeah. different. Like, it was a different world. So I have to kind of think for a minute and be like, wait a minute, was the coffee trade from South America established really a better yes. thing yet? You know, like uh, the rubber trade, like all of these kind of things where like, they were still kind of being developed they weren't streamlined like they were by the time you know nanny and i were living in kind of the western worlds you know even across mm. the oceans from each other it was just yeah completely oh dude there's been a lot of talk on the timeline by the way about like the euro poor versus american have you been seeing that shit like <laughs> is this, it mainly seems to be about air conditioning doesn't it yeah, about, you know, um... <laughs> yeah that's for sure yeah i would see on that yeah. That is one thing I remember when I when I visited England as a kid was I was like, why don't they have fucking air conditioning in these buildings? And it was summertime. It was like August. <laughs> so it was hot as shit. And I was just like, God. And I remember my parents had like a hotel room where there was like a, you know, they got a hotel room for the, me and my brother and sister and then the hotel room for themselves, you know, in the same hotel. But like they got their own room and they had like a, a window unit. And like, because it was like an old building in London, you know, like an yeah. old building that had been converted or whatever. And, and, so they only had like a few rooms with window units. So we'd all like go over there because it's like the only room with <laughs> air conditioning or something. And like, yeah, my American uh, spoiled tastes were like, why doesn't the, well, this needs to have air conditioning? Why don't we have air conditioning in every room? Uh, I guess there's still some old buildings here that don't have it because like it was just wasn't a thing until like the what, like the 70s where it was like getting mm. put in everybody's house out here. Like my grandparents, I remember had to like, they got it installed at some point in their old house from like the fifties, you know, like right. they had heat, like central heat, but not the AC, like just wasn't a thing yet that people, something people could afford. In my high school too, there was like an old building, the, the high school that like the newer buildings all had AC, but the one that was built in the sixties didn't. And they had like window units in the teacher's offices. And I remember it would always be like so unfucking fair. We'd be like, God, it's so, <laughs> it's so hot in here. Like, 
they'd let us take our coats off or something like they'd be like all right it's hot you can take your coat off it's like yeah thank you but yeah i guess that wasn't an issue in 1954 everybody nobody had air conditioning <laughs> like, yeah yeah even if you were in jamaica there was no ac uh god good thing deodorant was a thing right yeah. or i guess just becoming a thing uh, oh, the robber is the name of the character you're trying to Robert, think of. Earlier. Yes, yeah. yes, that's and it. that that sequence I think is probably my favourite sequence in any of the Bond books. That the fight in the aquarium, it's so intense. And when he talks about he's running out of ammo and he's talking about putting his steel cap sh- shoes on his hands so he can use them as like to attack people, and he's he's throwing shells at the um, the guy to try and distract him. Yeah, it's so intense that. And it was the fir- it was like the first. Like obviously, this is only the second book in it, but I, I I was thinking as I was reading that scene, Bond's a little helpless in a lot of these scenarios mm. where he's outnumbered, he's kind of trapped in a, in a in a warehouse where he can't reach a door without getting shot easily. So he's kind of sitting there, being like, "All right, what do I do?" He kind of has to lie, pretend that he's injured, like to to get an advantage instead of using his force. And again, he has like broken fingers and shit already. So he's like trying and, to like lie instead of using like brute force or like just punching somebody in the face. He has to kind of make himself weaker to like get an advantage. Yeah, and he, yeah. he distracts the enemy with a coin in the end, doesn't he? To to get him in. and because he would just he's just found lighter before all sort of mangled. So we sort of already know how it's going to end up if it goes wrong for him. Yeah, uh, really, uh, really intense. Sort and of. it it's kind of an ingenious criminal plot too. Like when I was reading the, you know, hiding the coins yes. in the aquarium, like bottom with these poisonous, deadly fish in the aquarium. So nobody's going to try and check. It's kind of like, damn, it's, it's simple, but it's also like, again, going to like that, how big Mr. Big, the villain in this is described as so intelligent. Like it is kind of an ingenious plan. If you were smuggling gold in and out of countries, well, you know, if you're smuggling these kind of exotic fish or like trying to import that, I would take people's attention off of the gold pretty easily. Yeah, no one's going to reach their hand in to check what's under the the surface. And you think, yeah, certainly in 1954, you would you, that could work as a right a way to to smuggle. No, no X-ray machines scanning everything. Yeah, like yeah. we are now. But yeah, that was. It's kind of like, damn, that is ingenious. And like, it's it's cool that like how Bond discovers it. You know, like. It's just like, damn, like, you know, they don't make spy novels like that anymore, man. They don't make the spy yeah. thrillers like that anymore. But he, and even that, like, even in the beginning, like the kind of the bomb scene at the hotel when Bond first gets yes. to America and he has the kind of classic spy thing. I guess it was not it wasn't classic till Fleming wrote it in this book, but it was like, you know, a package comes to the hotel. He's like, oh, sit it on the, you know, the counter over there. And then it just goes off, and the fucking bomb yeah. goes off. He hears it ticking just before it happens. Yeah, and it's just like I was thinking to myself, my God, like what a classic spy thing. Like, and you almost don't even see it anymore because it's it's almost become a cliche. Like I I, I rewatched um, Jason Bourne recently, the kind of last mm-hmm. edition of that where. I guess that one's the one of the ones that's not based off a book. It's kind of right. like they just, and Matt Damon's a little too old for it too. At that point, it was like 2016 or something where that, when that came out, like, you know, like 10 years after the last one. And, uh, I was just thinking to myself like, yeah, like you, you don't see that maybe cause it would imply like the spy isn't smart enough or something, or it's too easy. Or maybe it would just be like a bomb wouldn't get through the mail that easily anymore. You know, like, yeah, and partly I think it is a thing of it's to become too cliche. Like when you're doing that now, it's almost evoking Austin Powers more than it's invoking Bond. Like it's 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 the sort of the over the top spy nature of it. We should talk a little yeah. bit about that. I didn't think about that, but the Austin Powers. I mean, and I was you know that was huge when I was a kid, and when you were a kid, I'm sure like it was. Sort mm. of, I think we're around the same age. Right? Like, I'm I'm 34. Yeah, yeah and uh, yeah, same. So it's like like Austin Powers and then again like there would be no Austin Powers without James Bond because it's basically mm. a spoof of James Bond and the kind of in like Flint you know yeah spy genre but just yeah and without this we wouldn't even get to that level of satire like it has to be like established before you can even satirize it like years later in like an Austin Powers spoof I guess the Britishness and all of that is like kind of made fun of and, and all of that yeah 
with the because I guess it's you know an American Mike Myers doing it, but like mm. it's kind of the opposite. But yeah, man, uh, where let's hit the one thing I wanted to point out the book title where uh, Bond is talking to uh, Captain Dexter of like the CIA or, or FBI, and they're talking about the um, basically just like the line that gives the title of the book. Yes. Uh, bottom of page 34 in mine, he says, Bond looked quizzically at Captain Dexter. He said, in my job, he said, when I come up against a man like this one, I have another motto. It's live and let die. And I was just like, oh, there it is <laughs> right there. Yeah, and again, that's another thing that it introduces to, to Bond in this book is, is wordplay. Having titles that are wordplay that you get with You Only Live Twice and... Um, yeah, some of the some of the later film titles. Yeah, the, uh, the sort of witticism of, of Bond. But yeah, that is a great a great line, particularly hearing it for the first time. It's, yeah, absolutely. And it, the fact that it was it was kind of in in uh, and it was it was kind of against what what Dexter was saying. Where before that, he's like, okay, he said he said finally, probably no harm, but don't show yourselves too much and don't get hurt. He added, "There's no one to help you up there, and don't get stirring, don't get don't go stirring up a lot of trouble for us. This case isn't ripe yet. Until it is, our policy with Mister Big is live and let live." And then Bond's just like, "Yeah, well, mine is live and let die." <laughs> you know, like kind of, I'm not American. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the final section of the book is in is takes place in Jamaica. Where they uh, they finally go to the coral reef, they meet Quarrel, who becomes a recurring character in in Bond books. And I kept wanting to compare Quarrel to like the Moby Dick, like Queequeg, kind of this kind of yeah. black kind of island sailor that like is is becomes a partner and is like becomes a good friend of of the white you know quote white guy in the in the in the story, and they become kind of these like partners in in helping defeat the bad guy or you know and i was like huh i could definitely see this and i already said in the last episode that we did this with nanny we're like you know fleming was definitely you know he was an educated guy he was reading the modernist writers he was reading those old books you know melville moby dick and dickens and, and all of these guys mm. he was definitely well read in those <clears throat> i mean didn't he go <clears throat> to like the harvard in london didn't he go to like oxford or something or cambridge uh uh, he went. He was, I'm sure he went to one of them. I'm not sure which. Yeah, um, <laughs> you had to to be like naval intelligence back then, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And like going into Jamaica, um, pretty gruesome death with the. Uh, I mean, the the gruesome kind of Felix getting eaten by sharks, and blah blah. But uh, oh, what we need to talk the black scent. The Black Sun and the chapters. Uh, oh, that, yeah, uh, po exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is probably another thing I didn't know. I, I should look up the censored versions. Do they censor any of that, or do they keep it? Like... Not in the not in the audio book version. They, they don't. Um, right. Yeah, Ray Fiennes gives a very good. Um... <laughs> it's Rory Kinnear. Sorry, Rory Kinnear uh, reading it. Yeah, no, he does a good Black Sun actually. And that's one of those things that's become under more criticism now, too, where people are like, oh, these books are bad. You shouldn't read them because of stuff like that. Whereas, you know, up until very recently, that was considered a level of realism where, like, you wrote in mm. dialects. You wrote in a southern dialect. You wrote in kind of, yeah, like a black center, a black kind of inner city dialect. Or you wrote in a British accent sometimes. Or you wrote in whatever it is, Russian accent. or Yeah. Like, you yeah, know, like all, all the train spotting's written into the Scottish. Um, yeah. Like, it's got a Scottish accent. And it's kind of a level of realism. I remember reading one book from like the early 1900s. I can't even remember it. And it was like written, not even, it wasn't even like black inner city dialogue or anything. It was like kind of at the time, the poor white inner city dialogue. And it was so mm -hmm. fucking hard to understand some of it. Like I had, you had to like read it out loud to yourself to even get the sounds and stuff that they were going for. So I get sometimes it could be like confusing or whatever, but uh Yeah. I was like, yeah, we have to touch on that because everybody's going to be like, oh, well, Fleming wrote this. And I was like, yeah, but he was trying to be... I he guess was you trying could say to be cool. Yeah. <laughs> he was trying to show you how cool they were. <laughs> and uh, I guess you could say it's like... You could say it, it's 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 maybe a little corny or whatever, like blah, blah, blah. But like, eh, you know, it really doesn't matter that much. And there's really only a couple chapters where like that's like... the Really, when they're in the club... 
and yeah. they're and they're and he's hearing the conversations between everybody and it's going back and forth between like this guy and a girl that he's like sitting next to and you're kind of like damn yeah there were points where i was like fuck i had to reread this what's what's being said like yeah but yeah all right yeah let's get towards the end of the book here as i know we're going what uh what was i thinking out oh, big's philosophy where he kind of gets that great monologue about his philosophy towards the end. Because there's, there's a couple different scenes in kind of a classic spy James Bond way where Bond is caught and then he's kind of like, uh, you know, talks back and forth with the villain and they kind of let him go with a warning or something or he escapes because of some like, you know, thing. But there's this moment where Bond's reflecting on, on Big's philosophy. I think it's when he discovered the... Um, the cargo and the, and the fish tanks. Uh, yeah. And he says something on page 148 of my version listeners. It says it, it was a scheme after Mr. Big's philosophy, effective, technically brilliant, almost foolproof. And again, kind of going to this, like what a great villain that big is and kind of how capable, smart and clever. And I was just like, yeah, what do you think of that in terms of like big as the villain? I know he's like Mr. Mr. Big. I always I kept thinking sex in the city with, <laughs> with <Yeah>. the <laughs> I mean, he's he's the first he's the first super villain really, compared because like Le Chiffre in the first book is just a sort of he's he's a spy, but all he does is play cards okay and cheat at cards, which isn't really that big of a sort of spy plot. And like, yeah, this is the first um yeah, the first super villain really that, that Bond's going up against that has a network that has sort of slightly supernatural powers um that has bases he's got multiple bases and yeah and it's also the first time where in in the first book bond is very much dictating the pace of the story he's sort of pushing the for the whole time he's constantly challenging him to the cards and he's sort of making him uh, uh double down on his cheating strategy and he's sort of setting the pace of it whereas yeah in this it much more feels like bond is under threat from uh mr big mr big is setting the pace of the the adventure and um yeah no, and he's winning uh, a lot like mr big yeah, is, is 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 getting things done and he's 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 throwing bond off the tra- trail he he almost has bond's number especially when they're in florida and he's like having people sent to their little you know like bungalow that they're renting or whatever in florida and he gets uh uh tricks bond has him send at the hospital or whatever when there was no patient like to get him out of there and get yeah. uh, st- st- solitaire or whatever her name is uh the girl to recapture her after she ran away like he kind of gets the better of bond in a lot of these situations mm. and even like yeah when they're on the train going down to florida bond's trying to be like clever he's trying to be the spy and be like oh we'll get off at st petersburg instead of miami or wherever the hell they were getting off supposed to get off so a little bit further north in florida or tampa or whatever they get off in, uh, yeah and uh and it doesn't matter like big already knows he has such a big spy network that it undermines all the plans and like yeah so bond's almost on the losing end of this until the very end even and even the very end it's almost luck with the timing of the bomb and all that like yeah he's like and even like the in the pages which we'll get to listeners where he's he's kind of describing how desperate he is he's being tied to the end of the boat with solitaire and like he's just kind of yeah. hoping that like the timing works out before he gets eaten alive or bumped like scraped up against the coral reefs and like skinned alive yeah that's another thing that it introduces to to bond and, and sort of to spy fiction in general is is the elaborate death like all the deaths in all the deaths in the first book of people being shot or blown up or you know um just you know cut or whatever whereas this it's yeah he's gonna tie them to a boat and then they're going to drag them along the coral reef so they get all cut up and then that'll make the barracudas and sharks come to the blood and, and eat them and yeah the sort of yeah the elaborate trap or the elaborate kind of almost 60s batman style kind of death uh which is now another mainstay of sort of spy fiction is that you yeah you end up tied up with the girl and being lowered into something or being on a conveyor belt towards something or yeah. That's like, and that's like a big spoof. Speaking of Austin Powers, that's like the thing that Austin Powers spoofs because by that point, yeah. it's been like 40, 50 years of these kind of elaborate deaths, and they're kind of spoofing them like, oh, I'm going to slowly lower you into this tank of piranhas and not watch and <laughs> leave the room and, and yeah. they make like that and I think a joke. It, yeah. But it sets it up very nicely in this because the, 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 the obvious um, 
joke people always make about that sort of stuff is like, why are you doing this? Why don't you just shoot them both in the head? But it sets up Mr. Big as such a cruel um, and meticulous sort of person that he, and he mentions earlier in the book about when I kill you, I'm going to kill you in the most amusing way I can devise at that particular time. And so he's, yeah, you really buy that Mr. Big would is not the sort of villain that would just shoot them both in the head, that he would do something really nasty and horrible, like feed them to barracudas. <laughs> And even in the 50s, like, it's even more so now, but, like, kind of ballistics and stuff with, like, the kind of forensics <clears throat> where they can match bullets to yeah. the gun that was fired. They can match, like, what caliber it was. They can dig shells out of dead bodies and kind of find the gun that you that was used. Like, even in the 50s, they could be do they started doing stuff like this where, you know, the way that Big divides the devises to kill Bond in solitaire is you know, he makes it very clear that there will be no evidence. There will be no body left for yeah. anybody to even wash up on the shore and find you later. Like, it will be gone. You turn into shark shit, you know, like... I think the other thing about sort of, you know, why don't you just shoot them, you know, why, um, why are you doing an elaborate thing? He's like, well, you know, look at the cartels in Mexico. Right. Like, a lot of those people could have just been shot, but for some reason they decided to do something much more elaborate a lot of the time because the spectacle is part of the death and it's it's part of the punishment and yeah and the fear like it, yes it, it makes people more afraid because yeah because no, you're much yeah. more yeah you're not as afraid if you just think you're gonna suddenly get shot i mean the cartel like you've seen some of that shit like i mean yeah island live leak <laughs> <laughs> where they like duct tape you to the floor and cut off your nuts and then like let you yeah. bleed out and put it in your mouth or whatever and that's how they kill you like just to send the message and of course like the acid tanks and all of that like yeah just horrific <laughs> like fucking the the torture that they're, they're trying to induce fear in you before they kill you because yeah shot in the head's almost merciful like it's yeah. almost like you're dead right away and then like but then if you're forced to slowly bleed out while having you know your fucking balls and, and, and dick <laughs> cut off uh that's pretty gruesome yeah like that's a horrific yeah. way <laughs> to die on, on a sort of sliding scale i suppose e eaten by <laughs> eaten by barracudas is somewhere in the middle between those two. <laughs> take yeah. that take the barracudas on the spectrum of murder yeah the, yeah. the rainbow <laughs> spectrum of murder here we'll uh we'll do that uh, what was I going to say? Uh, the the idea of revenge, too. This is one of the times where Bond gets really kind of pissed off because he keeps getting outsmarted and outwitted and kind of undermined by Big. At the end of that one chapter, Midnight Among the Worms, uh, the very last sentence where he's kind of talking, uh, uh, I guess it's after he killed um, the robber. And he kind of, yeah, Bond grimly shut his mind to the horror beneath the floor of the warehouse where the robbers getting eaten alive by sharks. He turned off the lights and let himself out by the main entrance. A small payment had been made on account of solitaire and lighter. So like, yeah, brilliant. Where he's kind of revenge for the first time. Like it's personal. Like, like yeah. Where in the first book, and he's always like, Oh, professional, professional. This is my profession. But this one, he's like, Oh no, I'm making payments on like revenge payments. Yeah. And again, he's sort of he's punished a bit for his hubris. Because I was saying earlier, he's he can't quite believe the idea that a black guy could be that menacing of a, sort of a boss. And then he, he quickly becomes disabused of that when his his friend gets mauled. <laughs> Yeah. And again, in that really elaborate way, like they have this trap door in the warehouse that goes into this kind of shark tank where, I mean sharks are scary as shit anyway like most of us are afraid of sharks i mean like who wants to run into a fucking shark like mm -hmm. while you're swimming or snorkeling or something it would be fucking terrifying uh especially with like yeah chum in the waters or something like that when they get into that feeding frenzy yeah like we're always i mean this is why jaws works still you know like the kind of fear of sharks like this monster almost in the ocean that just Un unstoppable you. yeah yeah bite you in Unca half. the uncaringness of them as well yeah 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 when their eyes roll over white <laughs> you know <laughs> like that jaws thing it's and because that's that's how the villain in this ends up ends up dying he ends up being eaten by by sharks and barracudas yeah and i, I just oh. love this idea of of revenge yeah for, for the for this kind of tone that it takes like and there's almost like a level of cynicism to it as well like uh i was thinking almost obviously this is way before fight club but when he's on the plane going to jamaica after that yeah 
and he's kind of talking about oh the safety and stuff in planes. He's almost doing that Fight Club scene. Oh yeah, yeah, it is quite Fight yeah. Club, isn't it? Yeah, he's sort of talking about he's doing his own sort of satirical safety announcement about yeah, yeah crashing. He, he looked at the racks of magazines and thought they won't help much when the steel tires at fifteen thousand feet. Uh, nor will the cologne in the washroom, nor the personalized meals, the free razor, the orchard for your lady, now trembling in the icebox, least of all the safety belts and the life jackets with the whistle that the steward demonstrates will really blow, nor the cute little rescue lamp that glows red, like about how <laughs> like once the turbulence hits and this 15 tons of steel starts crashing to the earth, like I was like, damn, Bond getting like, almost like, I guess it's a way of showing him, like, accepting that he might die during this trip to Jamaica, you know, going after Yeah, he has a sort of, he has a sort of desire for death in, in a lot of the books, I think, particularly after what happens in Casino Royale, it seems that's something that comes up quite a bit in the books, is him, him fantasizing about ways he could die, or considering ways other people could die, or... And, and sort of living in a way as if he's already dead, like the amount of cigarettes that he smokes and to, but not caring about his health. And yeah, he he does definitely have a sort of thirst for annihilation. But it's, uh, That's interesting yeah. too when he's when he's training for uh, the, the 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 swim to the island. He like stops yeah. smoking cigarettes for a few weeks so he can hold his breath. Like yeah. it's like yeah, even in the fifties they knew like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Also, the uh, the one thing I want to just laugh at here as we get towards the end is uh, Quirrell massaging Bond. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the... he's, his fisherman, his sort of henchman, and also his masseuse after his swims. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on the first day he came home cut and poisoned by the coral and with, dozen, and with a dozen sea egg spines in his side. Quirrell grinned and treated the wounds. Then, as every evening, he massaged Bond for half an hour with palm oil, talking quietly. <laughs> <laughs> as every evening. <laughs> yeah, he's massaging him with palm oil, talking quietly while the while about the fish they had seen that day, explaining the habits of the carnivores and the ground feeders. <laughs> he's like, massaging Bond, that's like part of their thing. Yeah, it's a nightly massages while they talk about fish. This is, this yeah. is the, the queering of James Bond or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, and then that kind of let's. I guess let's talk about the end, and then we'll move to the movie here with uh, the kind of Bow Desert, the uh, uh, this big compound that Big has on this like kind of isolated island off of Jamaica, and and. Bond has to make this kind of like long swim under the water to avoid detection and kind of go into the sea cave to get into the kind of villain lair. And this is this is interesting too because it might be I think this is like the first like lair for a villain too. Yes, Bond yeah, books. yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> lairs have become quite a big thing, haven't they? That's. A... I guess that's another thing Austin Powers really spoofs is the kind of yes, yeah, the the villain lairs and and Doctor Evil's obsessed with the lairs like. But it is cool, like, when you have these kind of compounds or, you know, especially if you have a villain that's, like, this wealthy, smart, kind of cunning guy. <clears throat> and then, like, of course they have some kind of old island that they've turned into a compound or something. And, and yeah. Secret entrances and little hatches and 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 the danger and like how they defend it like and big has that kind of ingenious way of defending it with the drums and chumming the waters every night to like keep yeah sharks and barracuda like the flesh like kind of carnivore fish around to eat any swimmers yeah so, no, it's a it's a great fortress isn't it but, uh... yeah and i guess there's legend to it too right like it like used to be owned by some like plantation owner or something and uh or yeah and then now big owns it and like has used it as this kind of lair with the gadgets too like the trap doors like in the restaurant and stuff oh yeah the restaurant he's got like, they dim all the lights during the strip show and then they take bond in the in the film it's going down a, a um sort of elevator but i think it's just a trap door in the books and, and yeah that's great and because it and it's great how that's set up like when they first come in there, the the waiter moves other people away from that table. To, so that's obviously like the one table where you can do that. I mean, Bond's a bit uneasy about it at first, but he kind of relaxes because the strip tease is so good. <laughs> and snapped out of it. But yeah, gadgets and um, 
distracting yeah. him, distracting him with tits. That's a Bond's weakness there with women. Yeah. He yeah. can't we many of you can't resist it. Yeah, but ooh. Uh <laughs> But I was thinking that too, because like we talked a lot about gadgets with the kind of Casino Royale in the first book. It's almost like Bond didn't even have many gadgets in this one. It's like Big had more gadgets than than he did, and Big was yeah. like shown to like really like gadgets, like really try to invent his own and kind of like spy style, hidden like the gun in the desk that's like hidden. Yeah, and uh, it's yeah, the, all these trap doors and elevators and things and these kind of big compounds that have all these bookshelves like. They don't really show this in the the movie, but like the his little like office in the club in Harlem is this is this shown to have like no doors. It's all like bookcases all the way around or whatever, yeah. and they're all like kind of have many doors hidden in these bookcases that lead to everywhere else, and all soundproof to the point where you couldn't hear anything that was happening inside the office. It's uh yeah, he's he's. He's very high tech, which is not what you would expect from something that in the fifties that was doing a black villain. But for the, it would be the, he's also much more high tech than than the CIA even. Yeah, and even when Bond's doing that long swim, he's like dependent on like the military stuff, where it isn't so much like M yes. and Money Penny like giving him these gadgets. He's like calling like the Navy and stuff to like get shark repellent and these kind of like mines that latch onto holes that they used in the world war world war two yeah they've got to wait a couple of days for the, them to turn up which is something you'd never get in one of the bond films is bond stopping what he's doing for two days to wait for a delivery <laughs> yeah and just getting massaged by coral <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. He's not your massages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was great i was like what a detail to include and i guess like the very end a very smooth way to end it where it's it's so sexy with that last line and like Fleming leaning into the kind of the women the Bond girl thing more than in mm. Casino Royale where he's talking about like oh they have two weeks leave which you know we have that happen in the first book and stuff where they're kind of on those beach bungalows are big because it's very sexy and romantic and stuff and drinking champagne and, and just living and kind of leisurely on the beach for a few weeks and fucking and and like yeah. you know, they're both terribly injured, being dragged through like the coral reefs and things, <clears throat> and then just like the kind of what he said something about uh, we're going to a house on stilts with palm trees and five miles of golden sand, and you'll lo- and you'll have to look after me very well because I shan't be able to make love with only one arm. Uh, <laughs> there was open sensuality in Solitaire's eyes as she looked up at him. She smiled innocently. What about my back? She said, and that's just the very last lines of the whole story because her back's all cut up from the coral and stuff and i mean surely quarrel can help (laughs) (laughs) give a little massage uh, yeah uh, the bond i didn't even think about that there's probably so many bond like porn spoofs as well that i didn't even i've never really seen but i'm sure right that's we will we should do that for a patreon episode shouldn't we Uh... The art, yeah. <laughs> I really love how they took the... You only the... come <laughs> twice. Or... <laughs> yeah, and it was so clever the way they took this scene and they made it, like, with a, with a dick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, this, I mean, because that's such a huge part of Bond, and we talked about this, like, the, the Bond girls, the the allure, and I think this is actually something that, that Moore captures in the films really well as Bond, is he's incredibly charming, which we knew, but, like, there's there's this at least with the more Bond movies, it's much more sexual kind of open, maybe because it was the 70s or whatever, Yeah. where he's just kind of openly making out with random women all the time and kind of... Constantly got one eyebrow up the whole yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and like getting in close and they're like about to kiss all the time. Because uh, yeah. that's something... And load, that they... loads of double entendres in his in this, uh, speech as well. <laughs> And that, yeah. that's something that compared to like, you know, the Craig Bond, the first Craig Bond with the last episode listeners, again, go listen to that. It's up there on the free for everyone. It's like it, they kind of took that away from Craig, where where Craig was obviously sexy and he was still Bond and blah, 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 and, and all of that. And there's Bond girls. But it was maybe they just lay it on super thick with the more Bonds or I mean, I don't know, because I haven't seen all the Bond movies, you know, I'd love to see them all in order, like one day, just watch them all in order and see the yeah. character evolve. But like, 
I don't know. What do you think about that kind of Moore's portrayal of Bond versus all the others? If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavyboard. So Roger Moore, um, I think in in this one in Live and Let Die, he's just he's just got it right. It's just the right level of cheeky, but he's still got a bit of an actual sort of serious tone, both to him and the film. And I think the longer that Moore goes on, the more it verges into self parody, and the more it becomes a bit overly arch and overly double entendre filled. But um, but I think in Live and Let Die and in um, man with a golden gun i think he walks the the line just right yeah i would i would agree where i think he he's very charming as bond especially in this one i guess and this was as we said listeners the first one of Moore in 73 and i guess Moore did it up until brosnan took over in like the yeah no no he did it until um timothy dalton took over timothy dalton does two films in between Moore and uh and brosnan um But um, but yeah, credit like credit. twenty years, right? Almost twenty years or fifteen years that he was about fifteen years, yeah. It was, it, and and credit to him, like you know that that franchise could have easily died off, having done one without Connery that didn't do very well, and doing one with Connery, and then Connery not wanting to do any more. That could have been the end of Bond um, as as a franchise, and we probably wouldn't be talking about Bond here on the podcast in twenty twenty four if that had happened. But credit to him, he you know he invigorates it, and it's a massive success that film and he he sort of becomes the defining bond uh, particularly for the american audience i think as well yeah and i wonder because connery was quite old when he came back for that last one right like he was yeah and, it, and it's and it's showing and it shows towards the end of roger moore's era as well with his horrible liver spotted hand <laughs> caressing at young girls <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah that's because uh... he's not he's not young in this although he looks quite young in the film he's um uh yeah he's already uh, how old is he looked to be like in his 40s or something yeah he's already in mid 40s from this, <laughs> from that. so yeah it's um yeah but i think i think it's a good opening for him and i think it it breathes new life into the the franchise and it sort of shows that bond can be something a bit a bit different and uh and obviously all the american stuff and all the it's a different sort of black exploitation to the film's black exploitation because it's 20 years later but the sort of the black aspect of it is you know it's really exciting like right? all the the voodoo and the the american south and harlem and yeah i did get it's it's interesting you say that because i did get kind of black exploitation uh vibes from from this movie with like I guess that was a big thing at the time. It was a big like um, uh, genre of movie, and it was kind of had its own kind of category and stuff. But like, yeah, I, I, especially like some of the kind of dance voodoo scenes where it was kind of almost bordering, like really walking that line between corny and cheesy, and, and kind of, but also kind of scary with the kind of voodoo cult stuff. It was, uh, I got big vibes of like the yeah the kind of black exploitation kind of action movies of like the seventies and all of that, that were happening yeah. at the late sixties into the seventies there. And I mean, I'm sure they were inspired by that to, to do something like this, to maybe try to blend some genre uh, with the bond films. And I guess it was getting yeah. at the time. I think that's something that the, the more era is, is characterized by it's, it's, it's uh, bonds, not on the front foot anymore. It's on the back foot. It's chasing to the genres. So it does a black exploitation one. The next one has elements of kung fu to it, and then they do Moonraker after Star Wars has come out, and so add some more science fiction into it. And I think, yeah, the Roger Moore era is very much it's chasing whatever the, it thinks the American market 
once, much more than the the Connery era, which was sort of forming its own sort of genre. And, uh, yeah, they definitely start to mix more more genre fiction with with Bond in the Roger Moore era, which yeah, to 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 varying results, I would say. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to Moonraker too because that's the next book, listeners. Where uh, Nanny's gonna come back on, and uh, we're doing the the whole fucking series here on Heavy Board. <laughs> we're doing all of it, uh, and I guess when we run out of books, we'll just have to do all the 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 movies, the original movie. <laughs> we'll just keep doing that, but keep Bond alive. But yeah, the other interesting things about this movie, just for listeners, like directed by Guy Hamilton, uh, Paul and Linda McCartney writing the kind of live and let die song and i didn't realize actually like and i'm a big beatles fan obviously uh mm-hmm. but like that and i love that song it's one of wings you know solo paul's best songs uh and it's didn't realize it was written for this movie specifically oh right yeah yeah, yeah. it's just no, like it's, it's... wow like think of how big bond was culturally to be okay this big british spy having you know the biggest british pop artist in to ever live probably in paul mccartney you know the beatles and all of that yeah write this song and perform it and they keep and it keeps coming up like during the the, the, the boat chase and all that the dun 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 yeah dun, 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 like the kind of it was just great i was like wow like that's think of how huge this is and, and i mean now you know they always try to do this for bond you know like they get the oscar noms like you know adele doing skyfall or whatever and yeah and, all of these types of stuff, but like every once in a while, they have a really good one <laughs> that like hits with the kind of, yeah, I think a lot of those new ones are all quite, they're a bit like torch songs. A lot of them, they're a bit dirty. Whereas like, this is really action packed. There's a bit of music. And I remember somebody doing a poll on Twitter a while ago. I think it was John Daniel from the mountain goats to the poll of, um, the best uh, minor key to major key shifts in all of music. And, <laughs> and the, the championship got down to, uh, Ghost Town by the Specials, and then the, the the theme to Live and Let Die because of the bit where it goes from the sort of duh, 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 to, to the really happy the uh, what does it matter to you, dude? <laughs> it's McCartney, a nice shift, which is not expecting in the middle of the of the song. It's uh, wonderful, it's, and it's so McCartney. It's so only yeah. McCartney could do that. And I mean, I know we we haven't talked about this. I know you're a big Mountain Goats guy. Yeah, like I. I saw them live once uh, in this shitty club in Baltimore, and uh, it was such a strange crowd. <laughs> it was one of the weirdest <laughs> yeah, crowds I'd ever been to. Because there were like, yeah, there were like indie rock people that were like into that, and then there were like these kind of heroin addict people, like, kind yeah, of like that were the, the fake crowd. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then some folks, and then there were like some punks, and it, it was a very weird crowd. That all okay, it's I mean, it speaks to the Mountain Goats, like kind of music like because it has such a wide audience and, and base for all of the and then of course yeah there were the sums that some that were dragged there just for like you know to hear this year or whatever uh at yeah. the very end but still it it's great and it, i mean mccartney man like i he just i always say this and i mean we can i'm fine with going on a huge beatles tangent if you are like <laughs> where uh <laughs> like he was the hook guy in the Beatles, like yes. he was the yeah. hook guy, and and whenever you hear stories about how they composed, because so many of their songs did that, these kind of huge switches, um, yeah. you know, a, a day in the life or whatever, like like these kind of huge um, switches, and you you could only do that with like several different songwriters working together on these songs, and McCartney was all about that hook, that kind of melody yeah. that kind of bringing it all back to this kind of little happy thing that you get stuck in your head and you start snapping along like only he could have created this kind of huge cinematic song with this little poppy happy thing in the middle like yeah no it's a great he's so good at that because e- either of those songs most people would be happy with but to, to, to not waste that by doing two but it was all to be willing to waste two ideas on one song to make something so unique so this was your yeah yeah this was your first um first time watching them that died it was my first time watching because i was never like a, a, a diehard i mean i always liked bond but you know i was never like uh going back and and, and watching all the old ones although my father had showed me a lot of the old ones, like especially the Connery ones when he was a teenager yeah. were the big ones. So like Dr. No and, and stuff were ones mm-hmm. that he would always, I remember we had them 
on like VHS, and then like when the DVDs started getting released when I was a kid, he would like be rebuying the kind of Bond collections on DVD. Yeah, same. With uh, <laughs> yeah, that was a big thing. Like, so I remember watching more of the Connery ones and the Moore ones, and I guess because I was a kid, the Moore ones always, whenever they'd be on TV or something, they always seemed a little off to me. Maybe because I was so used to. One, the, the the modern Brosnan ones growing up where they're like very serious. There's not much humor to them, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then the, and then also the kind of Connery ones that are pretty serious, like not a lot of humor to it. Just kind of the suave, you know, charming Bond. And I don't know, just something about the more ones uh, I never really got into. But yeah, I, like I said, I'd love to just watch all of them in order and see the portrayal on screen evolve over like 50, 60, 70 years. Yeah, that is interesting. The the, the development of them. And I think yeah, early early Roger Moore is very different to later Roger Moore. Like the the later Roger Moore ones are, are almost pure comedy. A lot of them like they they they're like spoofing themselves almost. But, I, I yeah. the the one I remember I can't even remember the name, but the one where they end up in like the snow avalanche, and like there's like that big inflatable. That might be for your eyes only, possibly. Yeah, and I think he's yeah. older in that, right? Like, he's an old yeah. or more. And, like, they're, like, stuck there, and he just, like, pops up the champagne, and it's just like, well, let's just fuck in this big thing here. Like, <laughs> yeah, I remember that specifically, but... Yeah, interesting that uh, it was his first Bond, and Jane Seymour as Solitaire, it was her first role, I think, as an actress. Oh, right. She yeah. looks amazing in it. She's oh, just yeah. stunning, right? Really, and yeah. that's the great thing about these Bond movies too, is that usually all the women are hot. Like <laughs> all yes. of Bonds are like hot as shit. But I, I only assume that because I didn't look it up. But I just assumed because like when I was watching it, you know, the opening credits, they kept saying introducing Jane Seymour. Yeah, she she'd been a TV actress before, but it was her first um, film film role. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, she's she's great. And she looks amazing, and um, and her character they they lean in a lot more to the to the supernatural element of of her in this and and in general they one of the biggest changes character wise is they split the in the book Baron Samadhi and Mr Big are the same person and then in the film Baron Samadhi is a separate character whose bond keeps killing and then he keeps coming back to life and uh, pursuing after him and then the film ends with that brilliant shot of him laughing on the back of the train like waiting to pounce on them again yeah, and the big thing I noticed, sorry, yeah, screenplay for those that are interested because we are a writing podcast. Yeah, Tom Mankiewicz uh, was the uh, screen, at least the credited screenwriter for this. And it, as we mentioned kind of earlier in the conversation, th- th- this movie differs quite a lot from the actual plot of the book, uh, even down to like, you know, the villain uh, and, and kind of the, the overall, he's trying to smuggle heroin and not gold you know uh mm. and i wonder if that was just them kind of modernizing the plot you know to the heroin trade was really big you know frank lucas out there in harlem doing all the kind of heroin stuff uh the american gangster guy for those that don't know um but yeah the well, first thing i noticed just like right away was just like and also i looked up the trailer as well uh because I was just fascinated to see oh what would the bond trailer look like and of course oh they, right yeah i've never watched the trailer it's cool because uh, right now Max, at least in America, has all of the Bonds. Because I guess Warner Brothers owns the uh, the the Bond character or something like that. Uh, uh, they have all the films, all of the Bond films okay, are all cool. up on Max right now, and it's like um, the cool thing is is that if there are there is a trailer, they also have the trailer right next to it, so you can like watch nice. the trailer as like a two minute thing. And I mean, it's always interesting seeing trailers from like fifty years ago. Uh, how they did it and how they do it now, you know, but just that awesome, that first couple shots of the trailer and the movie are just that, you know, the Bond music, which we didn't really talk about, but like the, the, the Bond fucking theme, that 007 yes. music that is so iconic. And he's walking in that little kind of gun barrel, you know, circle mm-hmm. and he comes out and stands and fires, you know, very classic. And it was just like, Oh yeah, this is awesome. But just like my first thing was like this is so seventies like the whole movie like is so like seventies absolutely yeah yeah it's uh, it's crashing into the seventies <laughs> <laughs> and and what I mean by that is uh, 
uh, it screams of uh, everybody was doing a shitload of cocaine. <laughs> like, like I think like <laughs> yes. Mankiewicz writing it was probably doing a shitload of cocaine. I bet they were all doing cocaine on the <laughs> on the set. Like, uh, yeah, and Bond Bond's uh, apartment that you see in this is the most seventies apartment that anyone's <laughs> ever lived in. <laughs> I love that they show him with a girl right away. Like he's got this girl that he's not supposed to be. He's trying to like hide her from like M and from Money Penny and uh, yeah, it's almost it's almost like a sort of sitcom setup, isn't it? That his boss has come round and he's got a girl there that he's having to sort of move from room to room. Well, and they emphasize the coffee like that that scene in the in the very beginning with M when he's like making him coffee in the kitchen and it's like this huge kind of like espresso contraption from the seventies. And then uh, M just looks at him when he hands him the cup. He's like, is that all it does? Like, <laughs> just make yeah. this kind of cup of coffee? It's like, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's that's something very different to Bond, certainly from the books and some of the earlier films. Is like, you get the idea of Bond, even for the time when it's written, that he's not a big fan of modernity. He's not a big fan of the fact that the world has changed and sort of resents it all. Whereas, yeah, Roger Moore just seems to love technology and he loves modernity and he loves anything <laughs> anything convenient. And, yeah. And then, but I guess, like, yeah, uh, he... Bond loves his gadget, so of course he'd have a coffee gadget if he's got a laser watch. <laughs> yeah, and the watch in this one, I guess, yeah, they add it to the script. But by this point, I mean, how many Bond movies were made by this point? Like almost 10? This, this is the, the eighth, I believe. Yeah, so like they had this kind of, not formula, but like, you know, you have to introduce a new gadget every Bond movie because it's kind of yeah. become a thing. Uh, and some are better than others, but this one is like, yeah, that kind of watch. And I love the watch the mag- Magnetic watch. Yeah. And how he uses it to unzip her dress. Like, this is the first five minutes of the movie. <laughs> like, where he's, like, unzipping yeah. her dress with the magnet watch. Uh, Which I love because it's it, that's in no way easier than doing it with your hand. Because he's... <laughs> <laughs> He's already got his hand over her dress. He still has to move his hand down. <laughs> He just wants to try out the watch. <laughs> and she's like, you have such a delicate touch. That's like the line <laughs> as he's like doing that. <laughs> I was just, I just, I thought it really summed up. It's interesting how that first scene and like him, yeah, like using the watch, he's given to, he's given it for the first time. He's like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then he starts testing it out. And one of the things he does is to just unzip this dress. I don't even know who that actress was, but she's smoking hot as well. And like naked, yes. through like her short little scene there in the beginning. That's another thing I noticed is that like the kind of nudity is uh, not shied away from in in these Bond movies, especially when you get to like the later stuff, like even the Craig Bonds, like how many nude scenes are like mm. with like the women? I mean, like, you know, seeing tits be naked in the bed kind of thing. There's a few. Yeah. But I'm just like, man, like they really haven't put that in the more recent Bonds. Like, they've really kind of taken it out. And of course we know why, you know, everybody out yeah, there I mean, listening. I mean, that was part of the reason you went to see a Bond film. But, yeah, but... and it was sexy. Like, it was like, it's not even like, you know, showing them fucking, like, you know, you think of like 300 or whatever, where like, yeah, slow motion fuck from behind scene where the tits are just bouncing in slow motion. <laughs> like, it's not even that. Well, but that's a great scene. But it's like, there's just, it adds such a layer to the character and i think it really does emphasize like as we talked about in the first part of this with with casino royale you know bond's biggest weakness is his love of women like it always distracts him it always makes him vulnerable like the reason he's vulnerable to mr big in a lot of ways is because he kind of is has a thing for solitaire right away you know and he completely trusts that when she decides to run away with him, he's like, oh, yeah, I trust you. He's like, <laughs> it's so, it could so easily have just been another plot by Mr. Big. But he's, yeah, it doesn't take much convincing, does he? To... And they really play up the voodoo stuff more so than the book does in, in the film. And I get why, yeah. you know, one. It's good. Visually, it's great, isn't it? The... Damn, it started pouring rain here. Can you hear that? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Uh... Whenever it rains in the desert here, it is like it pours for like twenty yeah. minutes and then it just stops. But I'm like, damn. But yeah, like the voodoo stuff, which I think, like, yeah, might as well make it like a huge thing to kind of weird it up a little bit and kind of. And I, yeah, we talked. That's kind of the black exploitation angle as well. But uh, and I think that's always like I'm like when I was seeing some of the voodoo stuff that they were playing up. I was like, oh, yeah, this is very cocaine fueled. Like, just kind of, they were just giving out like plates of cocaine. Like, yeah, go crazy. Like, <laughs> go crazy. Do the dance. Yeah, do the dance. 
And it has the other thing that the film is famous for is the incredibly long boat chase scene in the the middle of it, which I remembered being really cool when I was a kid. And I watched the film last year and I was like, this is one of the most boring chases. (laughs) <laughs> because it's a chase scene where Bond is a full 200 metres ahead of the person chasing him for the entire 15 minute stretch of the <laughs> the chase it's, uh, and they make it almost like a Dukes of Hazard, like these kind of southern Louisiana hillbillies like they keep cutting yes. out like this sheriff that's like we're gonna get them boys like, who, who, who returns in a later film as well, that character oh really? He, yeah he becomes a new part of the Bond calendar Sher- Sheriff Pepper, yeah Damn. that's cool that i like that they do that at least but like yeah it was always interesting to me too they kept calling it the river too and i was like mm, when you're in louisiana the rivers are usually called bayous but and i know they're different things people out there would be like technically mm-hmm. yeah, pushed up the glasses but yeah i know <laughs> but like it's always just like because every river is kind of connected with the swamp and the they've bayous that have been carved out and stuff you go through them but yeah, there was that, and I, I I agree with you on that. With the kind of, I remember watching just, that chase scene, and it was the first time I was like, "Man, this is really long. <laughs> this is really yeah. going on." Is it? They keep switching boats. You think it's over, and then he switches into a new boat and it keeps going. Yeah. And like, and they just there's kind just of no, there's no obstacles in his way, really, and there's and the guy doesn't get close to him, and yeah, I don't know. It's just it's a bit like have you ever seen Speed Two? Uh, no, sequels? no, no. I've seen the, the first speed... one, but. Yes, first one, amazing. Second one is set on a boat. And the thing is, no matter how fast a boat is going, it's just, just in the water. It's like, there's nothing. You can't get really a sense of speed when you're in the water and there's not really anything in your way. Absolutely. Did you did you watch the new Roadhouse by chance, the remake? No, I, I haven't. Is it, is it and as bad as everyone has said? It's pretty bad. If you like the yeah. first one, like the original, which I do, it's... I didn't like it. I didn't care for it. I think they... They really hammed it up, but one of the problems was they made everything on the water instead of like in this kind of rural part of Missouri. It's like on these kind of Florida Key waterfront. Everything's on boats, and I think they fall victim to the same problem where if you're just on the water, like there's nothing there, and especially when you get down to the Florida Keys, unless there's a hurricane going on, like there's really nothing in those calm, beautiful waters. (laughs) Like, yeah, (laughs) it's just endless openness till you get to the ocean. Like, that's always a mistake. But then, and like they kind of add characters in this Bond film too, with uh, Rosie, the sexy black. Uh, uh, yes, Bond's first black love interest. Yeah, in, and in the, the, the way that she's introduced too, with uh, kind of coming in with the gun, and then Bond's immediately trying to bang her. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, well, that's the other thing that you notice in the in the, the Roger Moore era is that the um the the delta of time between him meeting a woman and sleeping with her just gets shorter and shorter and it is in some of the films it is down to under a minute between him <laughs> introducing himself so yeah, he's very quick to, to get her into bed and i love too that like they she's in there she's only in it for like what like 15 minutes of the movie in the beginning and we learn that she's like some type of spy of bigs that bond is kind of on to already but like wants to fuck her anyway and like bring her play along yeah <laughs> And, like, they have her change into the bikini when she's on that boat. And I remember she came on that bikini, and I was like, damn. Like, this yeah, girl. Yeah, no, like, she's stunning, isn't she? Yeah. I'm like, ooh, no wonder Bob was trying to get in that on her. And then they do fuck in the, in the, <laughs> in the jungle yes. on that, like, blanket or whatever while being watched by that, like, voodoo spy camera. That's where I was seeing, like, those voodoo spy cameras. I was like, oh, yeah, this is a lot of cocaine that went into the writing and making of this. Like, yeah. The, again, again, it's the great the great mixture of, which I guess, you know, is, is exemplified by Big in the book as well, of of, of the supernatural with, with the high tech as well. Because also like everyone's got radios in it. Like, they, they imply that essentially every black person in Harlem has a radio that they can call into Big at, at any point. And, uh, yeah. The uh, the other thing that always stands out to me in this film is there's a scene in it where Bond is is thinks he's being followed and he calls Lighter and he, he gets shot at from a car and he and he calls Lighter to tell him and then we cut to Lighter and Lighter says uh, we need an APB on a white pimp mobile <laughs> and it's really unclear does does Bond use the word pimp mobile? Because we don't hear what Bond says to Lighter, but so does Bond use the word pimp mobile? Because that seems 
very unlikely. Or is he just describes it so well that Lighter knows to call it a pimp <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And I wonder if that's the black exploitation coming in because I would feel like that was something that would be in all of like, yeah, the black, black exploitation and everybody. Yeah. Like Quentin Tarantino and always talks about how much he loves that. I mean, you know, Django Unchained and all that shit. Like, yeah, he loves that kind of homage to those. Cause I guess he grew up in the seventies watching those and, and they thought they were awesome. And a lot of them are pretty cool. I mean, even though some of them yeah. are bad and ridiculous, but like, yeah, I wonder if it was just like trying to blend that in a little bit. Or, I think they were trying to, like you said, since, since Connery was so old in the one previously, and I guess, you know, it kind of flopped, like you said, like it didn't do as well. And this one did what they were trying. I think at least it seemed that way. It felt watching it even all these years later that given all that, they were trying to kind of revamp it. They were trying to make it a little cooler. They were trying to yeah, yeah use language like Pimp Mobile or, or something or, or uh, just, yeah, use some of the slang and stuff in that. And one thing I will say with the, yeah, the radios, uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a deal breaker for me, but I was thinking with the radios, I was like, man, I wish they would have taken a little bit more time to focus in on a big spy network. Yeah. And I think they try to do that with all the radios. Everybody has a radio, so it kind of is implied that he has it. But I'm like, man, like, I guess, because I just reading the book right before watching the movie, you know, I'm always comparing it to the book, you know, for good, for better, or for worse. But it's just like, because radios weren't such a big thing, like nobody had them in their pockets back in the 50s. Yes, true, and yeah. It just made you realize how big and how complex and like, this network was and how global it was the kind of all over the country and the world with his spy networks and the, with the help of the Russians and things like that. And I guess they don't do too much of the Russian stuff in the movie version. But again, that might be because it was so long after like in the fifties, the cold war was so fresh and like everybody was still like fearing nuclear annihilation from the Russians and like, yeah, they they chill out a bit in the seventies with the Russian stuff, and then it comes back a bit in the in the uh, in the later in the eighties ones. But yeah, um, I mean, it's sort of it's so tangential in the book, even the Russian thing. It's kind of just mentioned in one paragraph that Mister Big gets some fun. Get, he's a member of Smirsh, but he seems to have his own thing going on. Right, that's one of the things that they imply. Like his intelligence is where he understands that he can use this Russian like kind of organization to help himself and uh, get money and spy networks and things in place. But he doesn't, you know, he's not like some like diehard communist or whatever, like trying to do a revolution. He's just out to no. make himself big and wealthy and powerful and 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 undermine shit in the process and. That's that's one thing I think that makes him such a good villain too, which which in the book at least, where his motivation is kind of this. It isn't even so much the power, although he definitely gets off on that. It's the kind of being clever is like a huge motivator for him. Outsmarting his yeah. opponent is like a huge motivation for him, which I think is a it's a much more down to earth motivation than like you know global domination or like setting off a nuclear bomb. Some of the later books, but like it really makes him kind of not sinister, but just like a, a cooler kind of villain. Like this kind of like this guy only cares about like being correct and outsmarting his opponent in some way. And yeah. And sort of entertaining himself as well, isn't it? That you get the sense he's a bit bored and that he like, yeah, he kind of likes playing with people that are, that are coming from. And I guess he has um, that monologue in the book where he kind of, tells bond all this where he said he's kind of yeah. bored and like all the last thing amuses him are these kind of thinking up clever ways to torture him, people and like improve his operation yeah um well one before i forget one thing i noticed in the book second book in a row where uh bond does a bit of union busting as well because he's busting a union some like a guy who's financing union in the first one and then this one when he's on the uh the Caribbean. He mentions the last time he was in the Caribbean, he was un he was undercover doing a union union busting job. <laughs> so that's that's what so much of spying is in the in the middle of the fifties. It's just undermining unions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is funny. I guess my guess would be, and this is coming from you know, I live in Vegas, blah blah, blah and uh, the spy museum in Vegas or the mob museum rather in Vegas is actually great where they talk about how because most of the unions forming at that time 
we paint this kind of rosy colored picture about how it was, you know, workers power. And there was some of that Mm -hmm. for sure, but it was mostly the, like the gangster, like the mobsters using it to extort like the government and these businesses and to like fill their pockets, like with, and kind of create this power that they could bargain with uh, over their rivals, you know, like even in Vegas here, well into the seventies and eighties, you know, the unions were incredibly corrupt and still kind of run by that kind of gangster mobster style from the early days of the forties, fifties, sixties. Yeah. So it makes sense that there's like a little bit of like, uh, spies are concerned with who's controlling these unions and, and who's. Yes. I suppose the, the fear of the, the Soviet union sort of funding and using unions to destabilize. Yeah. Which they probably were yeah i'm sure and yeah probably not all of them listening but yeah i think there probably were a lot of that but yeah that i think in the movie they kind of i mean well how do you think about biggs portrayal in the movie with the oh, i love yafik koto as an actor he's, he's fantastic he's um he's great in this he's great in alien and he's really good in um homicide do you ever used to watch that homicide life on the streets no it's no. the it's the show that the guy who um david simon he did the wire before he did the wire he did homicide where he'd spent like a year hanging out with homicide detectives and then just wrote them up as a bunch of stories. Um, and, uh, yeah, Yafit Koto plays the, the chief of the homicide department in that. It's great. But yeah. His, his performance is brilliant. And he's, he's really physically imposing, uh, in, in a great way, in, in a way that usually you would have a henchman be, uh, but he's, he's really himself really sort of physical, uh, and, and um, got a great voice as well. He's really booming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Voice. But yeah. And it kind of like with, with with that, I think like this kind of not that they undermine his his I don't know, I guess I'm just comparing it to the book too much. And I always say, listeners, you know, that like, you, you know, you have when you're when you're adapting a book to a movie, you know, you have to change things. You have pretty much free reign over whatever you're doing, you know, but uh, I was always kind of like they not that they made him goofy, but I thought that like some of his like what made him so intelligent and sinister was kind of lost because of like some of the devices and stuff he was like what's that the one at the end where he's like blowing things up with like a oh with like a, a air gun yeah. And, yeah and the constant use of masks for seemingly no no reason like <laughs> that when he first introduces himself to bond he's like he's introduced himself in a mask that looks quite a lot like him. <laughs> it's not like the mask is that different. Uh, and then tears the mask off. But he's just Bond in the room with us. It's like, why he needed to have the mask on in the first place is completely... <laughs> just, it looks cool. <laughs> that cocaine. That cocaine. Got yeah. Everybody to do it. The, the, the wardrobe department was probably like, oh, we could do this. Like, the makeup were like, yeah, let's do this. Like, <laughs> like that's great. They're like doing lines together. <laughs> And yeah, we talked about the heroin smiling instead of gold, which makes sense. They're trying to, uh, you know, kind of make uh, t- it a present. Tee he, his his henchman, is given a, a robotic arm in, in this, which he doesn't have in the. Which again, <laughs> it looks cool. It's, you know, it's um, and yeah, and he has a he has a voodoo henchman who is is not in the book. Baron Samadhi, who keeps coming back from the dead. He's another great. I think the thing that people remember most about this film, probably when you ask. To the people who, yeah, non Bond autists, like, you know, the regular <laughs> <laughs> Bond normies. When you ask the Bond normies about it, um, I think Baron Samadhi is one of the things that a lot of people remember about the film. He's like a really, a really iconic villain, and unlockable character in the N64 GoldenEye game. <laughs> oh, shit, yeah. Dude, and that game, that N64 GoldenEye game, that yeah. is probably responsible for revamping the entire franchise again in the 90s, you know, with that. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think like a lot of people our age, that probably would have been our first experience of Bond. It wasn't mine, but I think a lot of people my age, that's the first experience of Bond they have. If you didn't have like people that are in your family that are really into Bond, I think a lot of people played that on the N sixty four before they would have watched any Bond films. Yeah, that was me and my brother. Yeah, for sure, it was our big and it was and the like you said the the unlockable characters, the kind of extended universe of the Bond. Universe yeah. with odd job, you could get these kind of characters, Jaws, that like you could get these kind of old characters from the classic movies to come into this new video game version of. And I guess Goldeneye was like it wasn't even a book, right? That that was a fictionalized or a yeah, it's movie. just a fictional. The the name comes from um, Ian Fleming's house in in Jamaica. 
So he had he had a house called Goldeneye. That's it. Damn, one, dude, but, yeah. Fleming was such a baller. Like the fucking name of his <laughs> house, Goldeneye. Oh, the the other thing I sort of thought about when we were reading the book was, um, Fleming. I think we might have mentioned this on the previous podcast, but Fleming had this idea when he was working in intelligence in the Second World War to send Alistair Crowley, the Ameri- the, the British music- magician, over to Nazi Germany and pretend to defect, and then give Hitler. Um, false astrological readings to then sort of sway him away. And in the end, they decide to do D-Day instead, which, you know, boring. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that, that idea turns up in this because he the, the villain has a psychic advisor who ends up giving him the wrong advice so that they, they can help uh, Bond's character. So he sort of ends up using that, that idea very, years later in fiction. Yeah, very Rasputin kind of like... Yeah. That... <laughs> I love that idea too. Like I, I'm fascinated by, you know, I don't know, I'm not an expert on it or anything listeners, but it like the Rasputin in the rush, the end of the Russian empire and kind of Rasputin's role in that, this kind of mystical kind of fortune teller that sways people like just like how interesting that is and how, how most humans were all fall victim to that at some point. There was a thing uh, a few years ago, I think, where I believe it was in South Korea, where it, it came out that this politician for years had basically been letting their spiritual advisor dictate all of their policies for them. And they had this sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the mystic that they were working with, who was you know, di- partly dictating government policy because they would sort of attached themselves to this really high level uh uh, yeah, high level figure. It's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> anyone is susceptible to it. And just kind of like how clever you have to be to be that kind of figure to somebody, like a Rasputin type figure, or an Aleister Crowley, or yeah, like the amount of intelligence it takes to know what the people want to hear and then give it to them in a way that's believable. And it's, I feel like it's it's almost. I, I mean, to compare it to some of the spy crime stuff, it's like almost like a Tom Ripley kind of. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Manipulation where you can kind of just lie your way if you do it right and convincingly enough and commit to it enough into the, like good graces and like actually get yourself things and yeah, like a sort of psychic con man. Yeah, it's yeah. a very fascinating, great, great aspect for stories too. Like, great. I love reading stuff like that. Few few other things we already talked about. Yeah, okay, they make it kind of New Orleans instead of Florida for the kind of home base, and I guess they do that for the voodoo angle, like which makes yeah. sense. And they throw in some of the the voodoo kind of the New Orleans marching through the streets, like those kind of bands. Yeah, uh, that's a great opening to the film as well, isn't it? The this this is the procession that there's a funeral that then turns into a party, the procession. Yeah. And living down there, I was, I don't, they don't do that as much anymore, which is a shame. Uh, probably just because it's such a huge tourist trap mm. now. Like when you're down there, like most of the roads are just like closed down. And like when you're in like the French Quarter area, it's just, you know, bars and partying and beads and vomit and piss everywhere and hot as shit, like <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> humid as shit, swamplands. Uh, but yeah, that makes sense. And then one of the other things with the speaking of the, his henchman with the with the with the mechanical arm for no reason, <laughs> yeah, yeah. they have like the gators where like Bond is kind of instead of that fish tank scene, it's like he's in like a gator farm in Louisiana. And yeah, uh, the, which isn't quite as intense as the as the scene in the book. Yeah, um, but I do I do love that part where he he does. Uh, uses the mechanical arm to uh like rip the lid off that uh like raw chicken or whatever that they're yeah. feeding to uh show how powerful the arm is like you like crush things yeah can open and then bond uses the arm <laughs> bond often does uses his villain's disability against them <laughs> by um he he clips one of the cables in it when they're on the trains and he so it, it ends up stuck to the window <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I do love that. Like he's like trapped there, and then all he just like runs across the gator's back. <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> he just like, yeah, does he does a kind of Mario style kind of. 
<laughs> that cocaine. If you yeah. just jump on top of the enemy, they can't hurt you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I like that. I guess it, it is cool because he tries to use that magnet watch to, like, get that metal canoe over to him and it doesn't work. So then he just, like, <laughs> yeah. does the Mario thing. And then, like, yeah. burns. That's that's right before the boat chase, right? And then the, the fucking boat chase takes on. But, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Uh, and then that train scene. Yeah, they, they kind of – the train is so important in the novel. And then they move that kind of train scene to the end mm. of the movie. And I was glad they included it because I think so much cool shit happens in the train, like in the novel, like with kind of the spy network and like kind of because like the actual like going to the lair and like, you know, uh, trying to undermine Big once he discovers Big's operations in the novel, like the train stuff is like a huge part of the thrill, like in the novel. Yeah. Like, the kind of trying to avoid being seen, you know, staying in the cabin the whole time on the train and, like, bonding. And it's the first, the first time that he's alone with Solitaire as well. So it's the first of the romance you get between them. And, yeah. Yeah, they got to bang each other. Yeah, yeah. but his, arm, his arm's too fucked up to throw her around. <laughs> <laughs> Can't lift her up as easily or hold her down as easily. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I guess I like that they included it. Like, kind of like the homage at the end there, where it's like, all right, yeah, you got to include the train. Uh, and <laughs> his mechanical arm ended up there. And I guess yeah. they make it so that Solitaire doesn't even know what's going on. She just, like, gets, like, stuck in the bed. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, he just, like, folds her up. <laughs> yeah. And then she's like, Bod, why did you do that to me? <laughs> He's, like, almost dies. Yeah, that's great uh last uh all right yeah so we covered all that covered all that all right what 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 do we think book or movie better for this one i think book better for this one i think this is one of the best bond books really i think for, yeah. for me be, yeah this and uh from rush with love probably for me as the the two best ones uh but yeah i think i think i think book better yeah, I'm gonna. But to I say agree. all credit for the, to the movie for I say basically keeping Bond alive. Like if the, if that movie had failed, then it, we wouldn't have a Bond anymore for sure. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think the book is. I mean, I think it goes to how important Fleming is, and kind of people. Some people, some listeners, will laugh when I say this, but <clears throat> the literary canon, where I'm not somebody that shies away from this kind of stuff. I think it's just as important as yeah, something like Moby Dick. Uh, where Fleming's writing style was how clean it was and just how kind of propelled through it you are. Like you're really, yeah. really just, even when not a lot's happening, you're just kind of propelled through it. And I just, he captures, manages to make even the simplest kind of storyline, like a card game in Casino Royale, like really kind of thrilling and intense. And I think... Yeah, no, it He's a great writer. I think you, you see a bit of an expansion in his style in this one. It's a bit more flowery than, than Casino Royale. But particularly like when he's talking about the club scene in Harlem, like he's really evocative of the, the scene. He, he start, it's, it's less um, telegrammatic than the, the earlier one. Yeah, absolutely. There's, and I, I totally agree. Like there's, there's, I noticed that too. Like this one's longer. Like the first one is kind of short and whatever, you know, it's his kind of first kind of, you know, dipping his toe into writing books as kind of a retired naval intelligence guy. He's kind of in his later years, probably trying to write kind of fun stories about his life in some ways. Mm -hmm. you know? Not that these are biographical or anything, listeners, but but there's elements of it, I'm sure, some of the, the gadgets and things. But um I think mostly in, in sort of Bond's outlook, I think, is basically Fleming's outlook. Like the, yeah. sort of his, his outlook on the world, I think, is probably the most autobiographical part of it. Absolutely. And, and it just, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, just, I can't stress enough how important these books and the, and the movies, because the movies are, you know, more people see the movies than read the books, are to the global kind of culture and the artistic culture and kind of, you know, we've already mentioned this in the last episode, this kind of how influential they were to all of the spy movies that have come after. Even like when he was ripping the, you know, when Big was ripping his masks off and uh, in, in, the, in the movie, yeah. I was just thinking, 
Mission Impossible, like Mission Impossible wouldn't have done this until they did this in the Bond movies, you know, mm. and that's not even part of it. The book It's just something that evolved over all these creatives getting involved in making Bond movies and stuff. And like you said, I mean, I didn't even think about how pivotal it was to kind of keeping the franchise alive for as long as it's been like it could have died out and be just kind of this relic of the 60s that like we look back on and maybe there's a few weird autists out there that are obsessed with it but uh it yeah did not become what it is today and this huge iconic important thing and I did see like when I was looking up, you know, just kind of the basic facts that like it made something like hundred and twenty seven million dollars or something at the box office on hundred and sixty, I think. Yeah, it's huge, man. On on a budget of um like less than ten million, I think. Yeah. It's... And I know it's uh, funny that almost seems small compared to what like some of the Bond movies make today, but like that was huge in the nineteen seventy three. Yeah. And then you think nineteen seventy three dollars, that's basically more than the last Bond movie made. <laughs> If you're doing, yeah, I'm not sure what they are yeah. adjusted for inflation. I'd have, to, I'd have to look, but yeah, but it's, it's yeah, hugely successful. Incredible, incredible, the icon of fucking Bond. Yes. Well, Nanny, this has been fucking great as always. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, we'll have to come back for is it Moonraker next? I, in the I books? think Moonraker yeah. is the third one. Yeah, we'll have to do that, and I'm looking forward to that movie as well. Well, yeah, because that's another really different... There's maybe one scene that's the same between the two of those. They're almost completely different uh, and stories. Was, was that the 70s? Uh, yeah, because that's just after... Uh, that's just after Star Wars. Right, uh, so like that was like 70... 79, I think it came out. Nice. Right? Yeah. yeah. And that's um, more as well. So yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, that's fantastic. We have to do it sooner. I, I was, we... we there's so many to get through, but you know, whatever. That's always good. Yeah, let's yeah. do it late, later in the summer or something. It'll be good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Uh, any final thoughts or anything that we. Uh, as always, read Bond. Anyone that's listening that's not read James Bond that somehow made, <laughs> managed to make it to the end of this episode uh, and wonder what we're talking about, uh, definitely read Bond. Like, don't, don't write it off. Um, and I, I'm always surprised when. Um, uh, I had a friend stay with me last year, and, and uh, she was talking about her boyfriend, and uh, he said, "Oh, you know, he's." Uh, I said, "What's he into?" She goes, "Oh, he loves James Bond. He really is James Bond." Um, and then when I finally met him, I was, I was talking about James Bond. And after about five minutes, I was like, "Oh, you not read any of the books?" <laughs> he's like, "They loved, loved the books. So many. I meet that so often. People who are huge James Bond fans and have just never even read a page of the, the books." Um, and uh, yeah, I just think if you if you've even a passing interest in Bond, pick up pick up one of the books and, and read it. Absolutely, they are still good. I second that. I mean, shit, I, I'm one of those people that yeah, it belongs to be deserves to be canonized with other kind of great literary achievements because it's also so rare when you get something that becomes bigger than life like this. Like it's it should be recognized and yeah. And it's way less corny, you know, even if you see some of those 70s Bond movies, you're like, oh, this is Corn City. Well, read the book because the books are never corny. Like, they're always no. fast-paced, intense thrillers. Like, But yeah, yeah. awesome. Uh, drop your handles. Drop all your handles and your Spotify. And we're going to have all uh, that link below, too, but yeah. Cool. So you, you can find me on Twitter at uh, The Nanny State, and that's nanny spelled N. A N I, so the nanny state, uh, and you can find my music on Spotify, etc., as uh, Wrong Circles, W R O N G, Wrong Circles. All right, go check it out, listeners. That's linked below. Nanny, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a blast, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, we'll have you back soon. Heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy bored. I may say male is entirely hostile. No! Dinner. Resources. Life. Friends. Is boring. We must not say so.
a lack of gratitude for life. Bored. I, I aspire to boredom, I should say. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored. Has your night sweats and the day sweats, pal? Pal, I do.